first keynote address speaker. He joined the ABP group in January 2018. Prior to this, uh, Shiv was chairman and CEO for PepsiCo for four years and before that with Nokia as CEO for India and later emerging markets for nearly a decade. Shiv has been a CEO for half his career and was one of the youngest CEOs in India. Shiv has worked in HUL for a number of years, mostly in marketing. He has also worked with over 50 brands in his career and seen many business transformations. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Shiv Sivakumar, Group Executive President, Corporate Strategy and Business Development, Aditya Birla Group. He will be sharing his views on role of leaders in building trust. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much, Kayati. Uh, and uh, let me start, guys. I know you're running behind schedule, so I'll jump straight in. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this session on trust. I remember I did uh, something similar in uh, Goa, I think, two years ago. Uh, but uh, that was a different topic and a different audience. OK, uh, will you move my slides, please? Can you put on my slides? OK, so the, the first slide is up. OK, so the topic I've chosen is uh, uh, the role of leaders in building trust. Okay, So let me start by defining trust to you, and then I'll give you my definition of trust. Next slide, please. OK, trust. Trust is simply the firm belief in the reliability, truth, capability of someone or something. That's how you know most people define trust. So you know, I did something interesting. I just Googled trust. Uh, put on the word trust in Google and see what happened. Next slide, please. So I typed in trust into a search engine, which was Google, and then see how many you know results I got in under one second. Next slide, please. I got 1.18 billion results in one second as the search engine signals to you. So after that, I sat back and said, let me take some of the big names and what's happened in the last one year and type in those names and see how many do I get. Trump had 733 million results in one second. Biden had 697. Merkel had 85. Boris Johnson had 234. Messi had 115. Roger Federer had 337. COVID had 5.64 billion. And Prime Minister Modi, every time I do this, somebody says, why don't you have an Indian example? Prime Minister Modi, I think, had some 234 or so million. So clearly, trust is very, very high on people's uh, you know, radar. OK, that's the simple message that I want to give you. Next slide, please. For me, however, especially in today's world, trust means that you will not hurt me when I am vulnerable. OK, that's what it is. I think a lot of people in business, in society, are feeling vulnerable. And basically, they're saying, don't hurt me when I am at my lowest. OK, because normally when you're doing well, OK, uh, you're moving ahead, you got great tailwind. And that's when most people, most leaders, and everybody is arrogant when they do well. The real challenge is when you're down, when you're not doing well, that's when you don't want people to hurt you. Next slide, please. Thanks to what we've gone through over the last 11 months, people are feeling vulnerable right now. If you look at citizens, they've cut back on their EMI repayments by 200 basis points. Okay, They're saving more. Okay, they're worried about their jobs. 63% of corporations and people believe they're going through a disruption, and 40% more believe that yes, it will impact them. Uh, individuals are worried about whether they'll keep their jobs, they'll keep their jobs at the right salary. Citizens are feeling vulnerable. At a very basic level, citizens are saying, if I go out, what's the guarantee that I will not be you know, impacted by COVID? Okay, citizens are feeling vulnerable. Society is feeling vulnerable. Because societies are feeling vulnerable, we put barriers and said you can't travel. Even if you travel to my country, you need a seven-day quarantine or a 14-day quarantine or whatever it is. So every gated community is putting barriers. Every city is putting barriers. If you want to come back to Bombay today and if you're traveling either from Delhi, Goa, Rajasthan, Gujarat, or Kerala, you need a rapid test uh, result which says that you are, you know, you haven't tested positive for COVID. Okay. So the state of Maharashtra has put that. The state of Singapore has put that. The state of Indonesia has put that. So everybody's feeling vulnerable at this point of time in terms of what's happening. Next slide, please. If you go through the trust report, which comes out every year, 
Okay. Uh, what's uh, funny this year is that business is more trusted than government, NGOs, and media. The word trust has appeared, I was counting, 13 times in the last 21 years in the headline of the communication of the trust report. 13 times out of 20. That's 65%. So business today is more trusted than government, NGOs, and media. And we need to ask ourselves, why is that? And what can leaders do about it? Okay, next slide. The credibility of CEOs is actually the lowest, all-time low in India, Brazil, France, Argentina, Russia, and Japan. So you have you know, Brazil, Russia, India, part of the BRICS. Okay, CEO credibility is an all-time low in these six countries at this point of time for various sets of reasons okay next slide please so now you have a very strange situation where people don't trust business and the ceo though it's better than the others people don't trust media at all and i think media needs to wake up someday or the other they are like ostriches they just buried their heads in the sand and i think most pr professionals also have done the same and that's the reason you are in this very wrong log jam okay so you have a very strange situation where CEOs are not trusted, media is not trusted. Then you have to ask yourself, how the hell do I build trust? If two of the things which are in my command, which is my CEO, my leader, his voice, and the media which propagates that, if both are not trusted, then what do I do? And I think this is a serious issue. So it goes back to the question, why aren't CEOs trusted? Next slide, please. CEOs are not trusted because I think there's a bit of a history to it because they think he or she is all about money, is all about himself or herself. It's about inequality, which is hurting. Remember, go back to what I said. People are worried about their jobs. People are worried about their salaries. People are worried about their EMI. In that situation, they see, hey, you know what? There's a fat cat CEO. This inequality always existed. Why should I trust this guy? He doesn't you know, really empathize with what I'm going through. Okay. And I think many past CEO actions, whatever they are, have hurt you know, the trust in CEOs. And I think CEOs themselves need a good hard look at themselves to say, what can we do different? What should we do? Next slide, please. Why don't people trust media? They don't trust media because they believe that media is biased. Their interest is about the person and not the issue. OK, uh, Burger King, on whose board I am, just released an ad talking about why media makes everything sensational okay we have lost the ability to be balanced in media and hence people don't trust you okay if people don't trust media people don't trust ceos for whatever set of reasons then i think we're in deep trouble next slide please. so whom do people trust people feel they can trust someone like themselves they can trust their employer in fact post the pandemic Trust in employer is one of the highest across the world. In India, I think trust in employer is as high as 80% plus. Okay, they can trust their employer and they can trust the employer's website for information. It's funny, the reason they feel that they can trust the employer's website for information is because they believe that's better curated, better thought through, and will not have a bias. That's the reason they actually trust the employer's website. And maybe that's a place where you need to start to say, put out authentic information, but more important, put the source down to say, this is the reason why we are saying this. Imagine like, for example, in all our products, in all our advertising, et cetera, if you make a claim in advertising, you say claim tested with so many consumers, this is the research, research done by Quantum or XYZ or Nielsen. That's what we put out. Now, what stops media from putting that out? Imagine somebody writing an article which says, at the foot line, we have, talk to 30 people we have researched 200 articles before we've written this if they did that i believe those type of people will have higher credibility as journalists if you just write your opinion which is biased favoring x over y i think you are in serious trouble and i think you will see that more and more in the coming years next slide please. so if you go back to individuals today in society their biggest challenge as a citizen is to get relevant and truthful information. So all of you as people who are you know, communicating the company messages, the CEO messages, down to the public, down to society, need to ask yourselves, what can we do to signal that this is truthful information to the public? What proof points can we give the consumer? Or what proof points can we give society 
that this is the truth. Till you find this holy grail, I don't think people will trust either the CEO or the media. Next slide, please. This is compounded by another simple fact. In the 1960s, a CEO was measured on a maximum of three to five parameters. Today, a CEO is measured on about 50 to 60 parameters. Okay, there's reporting on every single measure by a company and a CEO. And many of these 50 to 60 parameters are in conflict with each other. So this is a serious challenge. This is actually a no-win situation. So hence, as you report each of these key variables, you have to be very, very clear about the veracity and the truthfulness of what you're communicating. You cannot say one thing one quarter and something else the other quarter. And that's the issue. You know, many times when companies go for growth, somebody asks them, what's your profitability? No, 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 we are not worried about profitability. We are fine. And they're bleeding like mad. Okay, this is the reason. And the Indian media is, you know, smart enough. They pick up these, they talk to various people, etc. So when companies themselves are fibbing about simple things, there cannot be trust from media, even on CEOs. Next slide, please. So I would say, if you want to build trust back, I would start with leadership. Let the media sort itself out. That is their job. But having been a CEO, and having practiced what I'm going to tell you over the next three slides, this is what I believe CEOs need to think about very seriously. And many of them don't do that. If you open the newspaper pages, the business pages today, every every CEO says the same thing. Every CEO says we are a you know, growth company. We are an innovative company. We are a people-centered company. Okay. And finally, every CEO says we'll double turnover in four years. You can do a cut paste job, everybody is saying the same. That's one of the reasons why people don't trust CEOs. Because this has become standard, you know, a typewriter language. So, next slide, please. The first thing I believe CEOs need to do, if they have to build trust, is I think they need to reach out and build positive relationships in the company and outside. It's a sad fact today that CEOs don't know more than their direct reports. They have not met the front line, they have not met the customers, etc. I've been traveling from August 17. Trust me, when I go and meet my customers in the textiles business or the cement business, etc., they haven't met anybody else. So if the CEO does not know more than his direct reports, 10, 12 people, how the hell does he expect people in the company to trust him? Equally, if the CEO doesn't go and pump fist with the customers, with stakeholders, how does he expect to build trust with anybody? The worst thing about leadership is leadership cannot be from a closet. Leadership is not a discipline which you can practice in a vacuum. Leadership is practiced with people. Trust is when people say, I trust you. It is not when you say, I've told you something, you better trust me. It doesn't work like that. So trust is innate. It's a soft value. And you can only generate that when you go out and meet people, look at them eye to eye, resolve their issues, show empathy both in the organization and outside the organization. Till you do that, CEOs will not be trusted. Next slide, please. A very important issue of trust always is competence. You have to be competent at what you do. Okay, And you have to be very, very competent at it. Apart from being competent, you have to be ethical in all your dealings. You know, a lot of CEOs forget they say different things in different meetings. And they think they're extremely smart, they've got away with it. The challenge is, remember, the subordinates and people in the company and the media are dissecting every single word you say very carefully. It matters to them. And if you tell the truth, I always tell my people, you don't need to remember it. If you tell a lie, you need to remember whom you told the lie to, why you told the lie, and what was the data. And I've always believed, and there are some people on this call who have worked with me, I always tell people, the media has a role. Tell the truth as it is. It doesn't matter. Okay? They might hammer you for a day, but in the long term, they will always support you. So be bloody good at your job. Your CEO has to be bloody good at his job. But more important, he has to be ethical in all his dealings. If he's not, then you're not going to get trust. That's the second one. First is building positive relationships inside the company and outside the company. Second is being competent and ethical. And the last one which is actually a very difficult one. Next slide, please. 
to be consistent and meeting all commitments. I cannot tell you one of the things the media tells me regularly, society tells me regularly is that CEOs fix appointments and cancel at the last minute. They cancel a day before, they cancel on the day. That's what they do. Now that places you as the intermediary between the CEO and the media or society or investors in very bad shape. This is terrible. So if the CEO does not have the consistency in meeting his commitments, if he cannot manage his diary, how can he manage his company? I can understand sometimes there might be a sense of urgency. But if you've given a date to somebody two weeks out, three weeks out, then it's your job to be there. In all my 17 years as CEO, I might have missed one or two appointments that I've given. Might be because of a delayed flight or something like that. Otherwise, never. For example, this call, I logged into this call at 11.35. I've been struggling to get onto this network. Okay, It was just not working. I got the IT guy in. Luckily, the previous session kept going. And finally, we were able to get in just about five minutes before the session, the previous session ended. So I would say, going back to what I started with, I think the CEO must reach out and build positive relationships more than his direct reports. It's not enough for the CEO to hobnob with his direct reports. Number two, the CEO has to be competent. You cannot have incompetent CEOs in the corner office anymore. And third, the CEO must keep his commitment, especially time commitments, to the stakeholders. And therein, you are compromised when your CEO keeps canceling. Next slide, please. I've just written a book on the dilemmas of a career from being a management trainee to a managing director. Uh, these are 10 career dilemmas. Uh, this book releases uh, on 15th. It's in pre-order right now. And as I tell people, I can guarantee you that your CV value will improve if you read this book and you just practice diligently some of the inputs which are given here. Okay. So please do order the book and please do spread the word amongst your friends. Uh, you are the best source that I could think of as ambassadors of uh, the dilemmas that somebody faces. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, the word trust, if you type in, under one second, you get 1.18 billion search results. Except COVID, I haven't found any other word which generates a billion results. President Trump gets 733. President Biden gets 697. Prime Minister Modi gets 234. It's like that. So trust obviously is on top of everybody's mind. Trust has become even more of an important word post what we've gone through over the last you know, 11 months. For me, trust is simply, you will not hurt me when I'm feeling down, when I'm vulnerable. Today, I submit to you, individuals are feeling vulnerable. Society is feeling vulnerable. Large communities are feeling vulnerable. And countries are feeling vulnerable. Today, we are in a situation where business is not trusted media is not trusted. Business is not trusted because people feel that the CEOs have been playing their own game. They see high degree of inequality. And when they go through hard pangs in terms of, will I keep my job? For them to see that their CEO or whoever it is, you know, uh, is at an unequal level uh, hurts them. Okay, So when people don't trust CEOs and people don't trust the media, what do they trust them? They trust individuals like themselves. They want authenticity. Okay, People feel they can pe trust other kind of people. The biggest challenge for us as professionals of this industry, what I call the engagement industry or the positive communication industry, whatever you want to call it, I think our biggest challenge is to give people truthful information. We give them information, but we need to layer that saying, this is the proof why this information is correct. This is the proof why this information is truthful. If we don't do that, it's unlikely it's unlikely that we will be trusted. In the 1960s, a CEO was measured on three to five parameters. Today, the street of Lo the city of London or Dalal Street or Wall Street measures a CEO on 50 to 60 parameters. And some of those parameters are in conflict with each other. And that's the real challenge. So CEOs need to practice, which is your leader, because you represent him. Number one, they need to have positive relationships in their organization and outside. They need to go and meet the ecosystem partners. They need to meet more people in their company. It is not enough for CEOs to just meet their direct reports. That is the sad truth today of 99% of CEOs. Second, the CEO needs to be competent. He needs to be relevant. He needs to skill himself. He needs to learn and unlearn to be relevant for the future world. 
And finally, the CEO has to meet his commitments when it comes to external engagements. Mm -hmm. Many a time, CEOs are not doing that. And when they don't do that, they place you in a bad situation. And as I've said in the 17, 18 years that I've been a CEO, I might have missed two or three, not because I didn't want to do it, but because of other reasons. So once you're committed, you must go through with that. So that's all I had to say, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, IPRCCC, for uh, inviting me for this session. It's always a pleasure to do this for you guys. Uh, I did this uh, you know, a few years ago in Goa. Uh, it is a fantastic uh, feeling. And there were a number of you who have worked for me, and a number of you helped build my per particular and my personal reputation. And I would always want to thank you guys, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I can't list out everybody, but I truly owe you uh, a debt of gratitude for all that you've done for me and all the hard work you put in for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on the topic. I think uh, your ending note shows what a leader should do. The gratitude uh, for the journey that you've just mentioned shows what a leadership should look at and how they should move forward. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you so much, sir.